Sometimes we just need time to stop and breathe, to stop and reflect and to think about our lives in proper perspective, to think about our lives in, in perspective of the goals we have, the things that are most important to us, the values that we have. And as believers, we need to take time to stop and reflect and not just race through the tyranny of the urgent and the things I've got to do today and the things I've got to do this week and things I've got to get through in the next few weeks and the next few months, but to stop and think, no, take a breath and think about our lives in perspective of the things that really matter, the things that are most important to us. And we've been taking this posture in the middle of the series we're in, uh, similar to the thinker, this sculpture, one of the most famous sculptures in the world. It goes back to 1904. I believe the original is located in a museum in Paris. And this is a famous sculpture that kind of embodies the idea of stopping and reflecting. Somebody who's deep in thought, evaluating their life. And, and a lot of people have wondered as they see this picture, wondering if, if this is somebody who's thinking over a tough decision they need to make? Is it somebody who's looking ahead and agonizing over a decision that needs to be made? Or somebody who's lamenting over mistakes that they've made in the past? Is this a glance forward or is this a look back? But this is somebody who's deep in thought. And this is the hope that I have is that this is the posture we're taking through the series. We're halfway through our series called Afterlife, where we've been looking at where we go from here. What, what is our eternal destination? And We've been talking through a variety of topics, how do we live our lives in light of eternity. Last week, we had a wonderful conversation on grief here at the Painted Post campus and at the Elmira campus. Pastor Brady took, handled that topic there, and, and we've been looking at grief and, and, and how, living our lives in light of eternity, recognizing the fact that we're mortal. We will not live on forever. Most people never stop to think about that, but we, as believers, live our lives in light of the fact that we are mortal. We will not live forever in our mortal form. And, and a couple weeks ago, we talked about heaven. I want to I want to come back to one thing I said about heaven. And as part of that, that conversation about heaven a few weeks ago, I mentioned that there are two heavens described in the Bible, the capital H heaven and the lowercase heaven, or the, the future heaven and the current heaven, and got a few questions about that. Wait, where does that come from? People had never heard that before. And this is where it comes from, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, where the Bible says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So whatever we call it, whether we call that the capital H heaven and the lowercase heaven or the future heaven and the current heaven, the Bible is explicit about there being a first heaven that will pass away and a new heaven and a new Jerusalem and a, and a new earth that will come. That's our, that's our ultimate hope is the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, and the new earth. I had a person I worked with for a while who always thought it was really clever and funny to introduce his lovely wife to people as his first wife. I think that's a pretty fast way to end up sleeping on the couch myself. But when you talk about there being a first wife, it's implied that there's a second wife. And when you talk about a first heaven, it implies that there is a second heaven. And that is our ultimate hope. And so we've been talking through these different aspects of our hope, what's to come on the other side of eternity for us. And today we're going to talk about hell. Welcome to Victory. My name is Steve. Really glad you're here today. And uh, whenever we tackle hard subjects like this, we do so by going to the Bible. We believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. And in particular today, we're going to look at the words of Jesus and how Jesus himself addressed this topic. And we're going to do that by looking at Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. We'll have this up on the screen or you can turn there yourself. And uh, we are glad to have you here this morning. And let me pray for us as we jump into the word. Lord, this is your word. And we are your people. And we pray that you would make your word living and active once again for us today as we open it and as we read it and as we meditate on it. Holy Spirit, do your work and open our hearts to the words that we're going to read today. In Jesus' name, amen. Beginning verse 24, it says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go out and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And part of what Jesus is addressing in this parable is this underlying tension, this age-old question of why does God allow evil in a good world? 
If God is good, then why does he allow evil to happen? If God is good, why does he allow evil and bad things to continue to happen? Why does he allow things like war and famine? And this is part of his answer to that question of, of that, that the weeds and the wheat are growing together. If you try to pull out one, you're going to mess up the other. And so we're going to let them go, let them exist together until the time of the harvest. And that's his answer to this, that there's going to come a time of a, of a reckoning, of a harvest, when, when the sheep will be separated from the goats, when the weeds will be separated from the wheat, and he's addressing this, and though he never says the word here, he's talking about the final judgment and about hell. And before we get further into the passage, and this so far Jesus has just told the parable, he's going to get into the explanation of the parable. But before we do, I want to define a few key terms, because there's a few key terms that we find in the Bible that, that, that are often translated to mean the word hell. And these words are Sheol, Gehenna, and Hades. Let me talk about these three terms. Sheol... Whenever you find a translation of the Bible that has the word hell in the Old Testament, it is almost always that word sheol, which is a Hebrew word that simply means kind of the shadowy, murky afterlife for somebody who's died. Somebody who's dead is in sheol. And there aren't necessarily good or bad connotations to sheol in the Hebrew. It's just a way of referring to someone whose existence is going on after death. And so when, not every translation of the Bible translates that word as hell. But when you see the word hell in the Old Testament, it's usually that word sheol. And then the New Testament, there are two primary phrases, Gehenna and Hades. The most common phrase, uh, most common word translated as hell in the New Testament is the word Gehenna. And Gehenna is actually a geographical place that you could go visit anytime this week if you'd like to, just outside of the walls of Jerusalem. It is essentially a garbage dump. It is a burning, stinking, worm-infested garbage dump just outside of the city walls of Jerusalem where their refuse would be taken, and it would be the smoldering, stinking, worm-infested garbage dump. And some of the Hebrew prophets had taken to referring to Gehenna, the literal garbage dump that everybody knew about there, as a way of, of, of pointing to the judgment that would come and what would happen for those who are wicked. And so Jesus picks from that tradition and uses that word Gehenna and uses this place, Gehenna, as a way of referring to people throughout his teaching about what, what would be awaiting the wicked in the afterlife. And so that's the, the primary phrase that's used, to, is translated as hell in the New Testament. The second is Hades. And Hades is a lot like Sheol. She, Hades and Sheol, Hades is a Greek word, Sheol is a Hebrew word. And they both have this connotation of kind of the shadowy uh, afterlife without necessarily good or bad connotations to either one. And Hades is often also translated as, as hell. But Hades in the New Testament, in the Greek, really is a synonym for death. To be dead is to be in Hades, and that's what the connotation is there. So these are the three terms we see translated throughout the, the Old and New Testament in, into English as hell. And this leads to four different primary views of hell, four, four different primary perspectives on hell. And I just want to walk through these four. And the first one is the traditional view, that hell means endless misery and punishment. That hell is, is a place where the wicked go and the unsaved go and they suffer for eternity. This is the traditional view. This is the view that most Christians throughout the centuries have held. And, uh, and I'll tip my hand here a little bit. This is the view that I hold, the, the, that hell is, is endless misery. We'll talk about that a little more. The second view is the annihilationist view. This is the idea that, yes, there is a place called hell. Yes, there is misery there. But it's kind of like a wick that eventually burns out, that eventually the suffering stops. Eventually, God, in his mercy, allows those who are unsaved to eventually just kind of burn up and cease to exist one way or another. And, and some people view that as being a more merciful perspective, a more humane perspective on hell. Uh, personally, I like existing. I'm kind of attached to the idea of existing, so I'm not sure how merciful that is, but, but there's this second view of hell, it's the, the annihilationist view. The third view C is the adapted view, and this is a perspective that, that hell is a transforming place to be, that that. Those who are suffering in the eternal misery of hell become so transformed by the experience of being there that they become sort of ex-human creatures, that they're no longer recognizable as human beings, that they become so degraded, almost like in Pinocchio. Remember in Pinocchio when the boys go to the pleasure island and they're eating and drinking and smoking and they're carrying on and pursuing all pleasures, and as they're doing that, they get transformed into donkeys? That's, that's sort of the idea of this adapted view, that in hell, the way that sin curves us in on ourselves, the way that sin always transforms us in the wrong direction, the idea here is that that just prolongs over eternity, and that, that sin and damnation curves a person in on themselves so that it becomes unrecognizable as a human being. 
And then the fourth view is, is the idea of everybody gets in. The universalist view that everybody gets in. In the end, God will let everybody in, whether they're saved or not saved. He's going to save everybody. And I have friends who, who believe this and want that to be true. I want it to be true. In my heart, as I read the Bible, I don't see how it could possibly be true. And we'd have to cut out a lot of things that Jesus himself said in order for that to be true. But those are the four major views. And, and as we think about the terms, as we think about the different views that people have of, of hell, there's a few things I want to share with you today. And the first one is this, the, that the Bible doesn't talk about hell as much as we think it does. The Bible actually doesn't talk about hell as much as some people think it does. There are some people, and I grew up under some pastors, and I've known some Christians who think that hell is one of the dominant themes of Christianity. It's one of the dominant themes of the Bible. But when you actually look at the text, you realize that hell is not on every page the way that some people might think it is. To, to dig into this, I actually looked at five different translations of the Bible. I looked at the uh, New International Version, the King James Version, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the New Revised Standard Version. That's the NIV, the KJV, the ESV, the NASB, and the NRSV. And I just total up, just did a simple word search for the word hell and the word heaven or heavens. And the word hell, when I, I, when I totaled it up in those five translations and then average, average it out over those five, and the same thing with the word heaven or heavens, hell is mentioned 22 times in those five translations on average. The heavens or heaven is mentioned 683 times. Two, 22 times for hell, 683 times for heaven or the heavens, which are synonyms. And so, in fact, the, the word hell does not appear in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, which is that, that entry point for the early churches, they begin on mission. It's the first time I heard that, that hell is not mentioned in the book of Acts. I thought, that can't possibly be true. And then I looked it up, and it's true. And I read through the book of Acts, and the word hell does not appear in the book of Acts. So the Bible does not talk about hell as much as we think it does. That's it for this week. Have a great week. We'll see you next week on Mother's Day. <laughs> I wish, because there's another shoe that's got to drop, and that's number two, that Jesus talks about hell more than we think he does. Jesus actually talks about hell more than most of us think he does. Sometimes people have this picture of Jesus that he's soft and warm and fuzzy, and, and he doesn't, you know, the Old Testament talks about these things, but Jesus doesn't. No, Jesus actually talks about hell. And I'm not trying to be clever or cute by this, of trying to have it both ways. The, old, the Bible doesn't talk about it, but Jesus does. No, actually, the Bible talks about hell less than we think it does. But when we look at the New Testament and all the references to hell, more than 80% of them come from the lips of Jesus. More than 80% of the references to hell come from the mouth of Jesus. And so while some people might look at this as not being a topic that is, is drilled down on as much as we might think it is, because Jesus is the one who primarily brings it into the New Testament, we have to stop and pay attention to this. And the way that Jesus approaches this is primarily through this parable. And this is how he explains. He's told the parable now. Now he's going to begin explaining this to his disciples in verse 40. As he says, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And I'll jump into verse 47. Once again, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down to, into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets but threw the bad away. It's interesting here in this parable, and then this passage that we talked about those key terms. But Jesus doesn't talk about Hades. He doesn't talk about Gehenna. He doesn't talk about Sheol. He doesn't use any words that are translated into hell. But he does talk about a reckoning. He talks about a, a time of judgment, a time of separation that's going to come when the weeds are separated from the wheat, when the, when, the, when the wicked are separated from the righteous, when the good fish are separated from the bad fish, when and when the sheep are separated from the goats, when there's going to come a time when there's a reckoning, and he's making this so painfully clear that the clock is ticking and there is going to come a time. Though the farmer right now is sitting back and letting the weeds and the wheat grow up together, there's going to come a time when that's not the case, when the weeds are going to be harvested and thrown into the fire and the wheat are harvested and kept. Are harvested and kept. But, but I think what's something that's really important for us as we think about this is number three. How can we think about hell without tears? comes from John Stott, who's a pastor in England for many years. How can we think about hell without tears? 
people that I know and love are going to be there. People that I know and love, that's where their life is pointed, and they don't have any clue. This is something that adds great urgency to everything we do, but we don't, this is not a doctrine that make, makes us gloat. This isn't a doctrine that makes us celebrate or pump our fists. This is miserable. As Pastor A.J. Swoboda says, I don't like hell. In fact, I hate hell, but I believe in hell because Jesus believed in hell. Jesus never tells me I have to like it. You know why? Because Jesus doesn't like hell. He hates it. He doesn't get off on anyone going there. In fact, the people who like hell are the problem. They probably have someone in mind they wish were there. You don't have to like this idea. You don't have to like hell. It's better if you don't. I think the, the worst kind of Christians are those who really love this doctrine and love to celebrate, and they've got pictures of people in their mind who they're really hoping to end up there. And it's not our job to determine who's going to be there or to try to predict who's going to be there. I know that there will be surprises. And we don't, we don't celebrate this. We don't gloat over this doctrine. It's a doctrine that, as I said, adds urgency to everything we do, and we have to only ever speak of it with tears, with the weight of what we're talking about and a sense of, of, of dread for, for the people we love. And there's a phrase that Jesus uses repeatedly. Though he doesn't use Gehenna or Sheol or Hades in this, in this parable, in this description, there's a phrase that he keeps using, and we see this in verse 49. He says, This then is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace. And this is the phrase, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a phrase that Jesus uses as kind of his dominant picture of what hell is going to be like, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here he talks about the furnace, that the weeds are going to be thrown into the furnace, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And other places, seven times he uses this phrase, the darkness outside where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he describes it that way, as though there's just darkness outside. And this is an important distinction for us to make, that hell and heaven are not two equal and opposite places like Belgium and Venezuela or the United States and Canada. These aren't two equal and opposite places like two houses on your street. It's more like your home and then every place else in the world that is not your home. There is heaven and then there is the darkness outside. And this is the, the picture that Jesus is painting throughout his teaching, that there is heaven where the presence of God is. There's heaven where what God wants to have happen happens. And then there is the darkness outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And one of the most helpful ways of thinking about this that I've come across is number four that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. It's from C.S. Lewis. This is the full quote from Lewis. He says, all that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the end, that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. One of the struggles we often have in thinking about hell is the idea of how could a good God send somebody to hell? How could a good God send somebody to the fires of hell that just seems so out of character with God? But, but this perspective on it, that the idea that if we think about heaven as, as where God is and the darkness outside as being where hell really exists, the darkness outside of heaven, then and this picture that the doors of hell are locked from the inside, we recognize that this is the choice of somebody who is so hard in their heart that they won't let God in. That that we have locked the doors of our hearts. I got we become uh, so rigid against God that we refuse to let him in. And it seems ridiculous. Why would anybody choose hell over heaven? But people make bad choices all the time. There are people who don't take care of themselves and then deal with health issues down the road. There are people who choose to smoke, even though we know so, so much about the way that smoking damages your lungs. There are people who choose to cheer for the Miami Dolphins. And <laughs> people make bad choices all the time. And there's this pattern of choices that cause us to lock the gates of hell from the inside. And so it's not that God won't let them in. It's that God, he, they won't let God in. They could lock, unlock the door at any time and walk into God's presence, but they refuse. Probably one of the most helpful books I've read on this is an allegory. It's written by C.S. Lewis. This is where this idea comes from. It's in his book, The Great Divorce, which is an allegory, and it's about an uh, allegorical bus ride of people who come from heaven, take a bus ride from heaven into hell, and the great surprise, the spoiler alert of the, of the book, is that everybody in hell doesn't want to leave. They can't imagine why, they'd want, why they would ever be happy in that place. And over and over again, it, it, he paints this picture of, the, of this reality that the doors of hell are locked from the inside and people who refuse to leave there. 
as he says in that book, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, fine, have it your way. Your will be done. A couple weeks ago when we were talking about heaven, I talked about some social issues. And I'm not going to rehash all those now. But we talked about the, the obligation we have as a church, as believers, to be a colony of heaven on earth. To be people who bring light into the darkness and all the different ways that God has called us to be a counterculture, several different ways that God has called us to be a counterculture in the land of death, to be a colony of heaven in the land of death. And part of the reality of that is because if, if heaven is your eternal destiny, you don't have to wait until you die to begin to experience that. You can begin to experience abundant life now on this side of eternity. And as a corollary of that, there are a whole lot of people, I'm not being, trying to be vulgar as I say this, there are a whole lot of people who are experiencing a living hell on this side of eternity. And so our task is to be a colony of heaven among people who are experiencing a living hell now. To be a counterculture, to be, a, to be an alternate society in the midst of a land of death as we, as we bring the abundant life that's available to us in Christ here among people who are experiencing very real misery and miserable circumstances. Whatever word you want to use to describe hell, the word I refer to is just miserable. It is miserable. It is to be miserable and experience misery as you're separated from God. And the doors of hell are locked from the inside. Um, our task, again, is to be a colony of heaven among people who are experiencing a living hell. And when you pursue God, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bring up there, down here. And when you resist God, you begin experiencing life as a living hell. Right now. And you know people who are doing this. And many of us have experienced that. That's part of how we ended up in Christ is because we were so miserable. We had chosen our own way. We had chosen our own path. And we had tried to do things in our own way. And the end result of that every single time without fail is misery. So Jesus, he could have used the term Gehenna or Hades or Sheol. He said he just uses this phrase that he uses so often outside the darkness outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the theme throughout this that's so clear is that there is a looming judgment. Whatever else we may think about it, Jesus is making it clear in this place and many other places that the clock is ticking. That there is time right now, but the clock is ticking. And sooner or later, the clock is going to run out and the fishermen are going to pull the, the net into the boat and they're going to separate it then or they're going to, the harvest is time is going to come for the, the, for the wheat and the wheat and the weeds are going to be separated. There's going to come a time when the sheep are separated from the goats, when the righteous are separated from the wicked. And right now the clock is ticking, but sometime the clock is going to stop. And it's going to be too late to make our choice. And Jesus says there is going to come this time. Right now there is time to change. Right now there is an opportunity to change the road that you're on. But time is going to run out. And only you can make that choice. And he says to his disciples in verse 51, Have you understood all these things? Yes, they replied. And the question is now in our lap. I don't like the idea of hell. I almost brought in a guest speaker to speak on this one because I really didn't want to talk about it. Um, but the clock is ticking. There is a judgment that is looming. There's going to come a time when we are called into account for our deeds. And there will be a lot of people who, when that time comes, find themselves on the wrong side of the equation and they're going to have no one to blame for, but themselves. And there will be a lot of us who find ourselves in the presence of our Heavenly Father and have no one to thank but Jesus. What about you? I talked earlier about the thinker and that sculpture and that pose we're trying to take, that posture we're trying to take. And I asked the question uh, that, that so many people ask, what is he thinking about? Well, we happen to actually know what he was thinking about because this, the thinker, though he's so famous, was actually originally part of a much larger sculpture. And this is a, a sculpture called the Gates of Hell. And right above the seam of the door, you can see the thinker there perched above the door. He was not just thinking about his life. He was not just thinking about decisions he had made. In the original form of this artwork, he was there as, part, as out in front of this backdrop of the misery and suffering of hell, contemplating his life in light of the looming judgment. And now it's our turn. It's interesting that the thinker was originally part of that artwork called the gates of hell because we know that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. So unlock the door. 
Come out, come out wherever you are. Only you can unlock the door. The Lord says, I stand at the door and knock. Come out. Come out. Don't stay locked behind yourself. Don't stay locked back there behind your past. Don't stay locked back in there in your own independence and desire to do it your own way. Unlock the door. Let the light come in and receive the goodness of what Christ has for you. Let me pray for you. Lord, our minds right now even are flooded with the faces and names of people we know and love who are just miserable. People who are really, really experiencing hell on earth right now. And we thank you for the, tras- the task that you've entrusted to us to be a colony of heaven in a land of death, to be a colony of heaven among people who are experiencing hell on earth. Help us to be a light in the darkness. Help us to be a a counterculture, an alternate society within a wayward society. And right now, I want to pray for you, pray with you, that if you are recognizing that your heart has been hardened to the Lord and you've kept yourself distant from him, that you've locked yourself safe and secure away from God, and you're feeling the effects of that. You're feeling the consequences of that. Kind of in your mind's eye, reach over to the door. Unlock the door. Swing that door open and pray with me, Lord Jesus. Here I am. Wash me clean. Set me right. Make me new. I've made a mess of things and I throw myself at your mercy. I've got no one to blame but me for the mess that I'm in. And I know I've got no hope but you to come out of it. So Lord Jesus, bring me out. Set me right. Lead me in the paths of righteousness. Lead me into a, a eternal life and abundant life for your name's sake, because of your great mercy for us. Your name is great, greatly to be praised. We pray this all in your name.